Hymn number, hymn number. Here I'm still giving hymns. Hymn number First Peter. Yeah, it's good to see folks coming back. We'll have some more coming in over the next couple days. Uh, Roy, there's a family that called me the other day, and I'm, I'm not 100% positive. Um, they're supposed to call me tomorrow and let me know what their status is. But um, it's a lady that's been following us for a while, and I think she said it was her brother. Uh, I may be getting all this all wrong, or her son, or something like that. But anyway, um, he uh, wants to visit with me and sit with me uh, about some things. And I told her, I said, well, you know, from like Saturday night on, that's going to be very difficult. Uh, but if you guys come in a little bit early, uh, that, that might work out. Well, long story short, I, I told him about our Bible study that we have on Thursday night, every other Thursday, Thursday night, for uh, those who have addictions. And um, so he may be sitting in on that meeting with us. So, uh, yeah, I told him that would be uh, probably a good thing to do. So they may try to, they're coming all the way out from uh, Oklahoma, around the Oklahoma City, greater Oklahoma City area. I think Enid, Oklahoma is what she said. Uh, but they're going to try to get here hopefully before 7 o'clock tomorrow night so that he can uh, be part of that with us. So that was kind of exciting to me, and I, I just pray that they make it, and we look forward to having a good time with them and good time with everybody else. And... Um, we never know what kind of weather we're going to get for homecoming. This is probably about the coolest that we've had it. And for if you're not from this area, to, to be in St. Louis in August and it be in the upper 70s, that's just... That, I won't say it never happens, but it's not normal. So, But we'll take it. Amen. Amen. Uh, those showers of blessings coming down there for a reason. First Peter chapter three. Uh, hold your place there, but let's go to Romans six, and we'll start there tonight. We've been teaching about things related to salvation, what salvation is, what salvation is not, um, and I guess just over the years, I've I've just trying to get out of using man-made terms for doctrines that I believe. Um, because I'd just rather say it the Bible way. And um, if with all these different denominations and their doctrines, when I was in Bible college, I heard that there was like well over 50 different Baptists denominations in America. That's a lot of different Baptists. And um, so when I say I'm a Baptist, what kind of Baptist are you? Well, God's never asked me that question, to be honest with you. So um, it's best to just stick with what the Bible says. And as far as saying, well, I believe this and I believe in this, I, I, I just ask me what verse in the Bible and I'll tell you, I believe it. So I believe what God says about salvation, and we know that a lot of churches get this right, but we also know a lot of churches get this wrong. One of which I would say would be that, I'll just name one in particular, the Church of Christ denomination. They, they to me, this is what, I'm not saying anything against any individual person, but a denomination as a whole who claims that water, baptistry, baptism is an absolute necessity for salvation and without it you're not going to heaven, I would classify that as that's not the gospel. The gospel's not there. They don't know it. And I'll tell you a story. Uh, and when I was in Bible college, one of my prayer uh, captains. We had a uh, usually an upperclassman that was over us in each dorm, in each dorm section. And ours was Steve, and I liked Steve. He was a good guy. And um, but 
he was taken advantage of one night because Steve liked to go out. He just, any chance he'd get to talk about the Lord to somebody, he'd take it, his young minister student. And a man approached him and, and said, I heard that you're like uh, studying to be a preacher. And he said, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus one night. He said, I'm kind of, uh, you know, interested in maybe coming to your church. Well, you tell me that, I'm going to be there. You name the time and place and I'll be there. Well, when Steve got to where this man was supposed to meet him, his heart sunk immediately. That man was no more interested in the gospel than he was anything. What he was trying to do was uh, infiltrate into Steve's beliefs about the gospel and try to counter-indoctrinate him with Church of Christ doctrine, which is you must be saved by water baptism. I mean, his heart just sunk immediately. This guy set him up under false pretenses. Now, I've said this before. You don't tell lies so you can get to somebody to tell the truth. And if you have to hide what you're doing, that must tell you, that should tell you that God's not in what you're doing. For we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, the Bible says. <clears throat> there are several groups that that's their whole plan of action is to deceive people, but to get them, once we got them there, now we're gonna, they're going to sit and listen to what we have to say. Then we bet we can change their mind. But if you deceived them in the first place, number one, if you did that to me, I'm not giving you two minutes. I want to let you know what I think of you and I'm out of there. But the Church of Christ teaches that you must be water baptized in, not just water baptized in general, in their baptistry. In their baptistry. And there's some other things that they say that I don't go along with it, but that's pri the primary one. So I mentioned this last Wednesday night. Let's, let's look at this issue of what is baptism? Does baptism save us? Okay. And uh, if you look up there on the screen, at verse, I have second, uh, first Peter chapter 3, verse 21, where uh, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Now, if you were to just take that piece of that verse out of the Bible and say, see, you have to be saved by being baptized. Well, that might convince somebody. But number one, it's taken out of the context of what comes before and what comes after. Number two, it doesn't match the rest of the scriptures. And that's what it has to do. It has to match the rest of the scriptures. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to touch on that issue uh, tonight, maybe next Wednesday night and so on. Got a lot of folks to pray for. Sister Linda Toomey's in the hospital. Uh, they're not going to give her the back surgery that they said. Um, her, her heart is not in good shape right now. And she's still got so much fluid on her. They're trying to try to get that out of her. So please pray for her. It's always, a, it's always kind of a scary thing when she goes in the hospital or when she has something going on with her heart. So pray for her. Uh, pray for Sister Bonnie. And uh, just pray for several others that could use some prayer. And got a situation, somebody in our church uh, is being, a wolf is after them. I'll say it this way. A wolf is after them. And I just don't take too much for that. So anyway, we'll just pray tonight, all right? First, uh, Romans 6. Let me read these verses and we'll go to prayer. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And that's a question mark. And of course, the answer is no. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. It's like the old boy, they asked the old boy, was you baptized into Jesus? I said, no, I was baptized in a baptistry. Well, okay. Know ye not that so many of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we have been, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve Sin. Let's go to the Lord prayer tonight, and then we'll have our, our uh, uh, regular prayer time after the, after the teaching. 
Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing Jeremy and his daughters, uh, Father, uh, all the way up from Texas. We pray, dear God, that uh, we thank the Lord that they got here safely. And we pray, dear God, that uh, we enjoy their fellowship. And we're looking forward to having a good time with them and many others. And I pray, dear God, that you would not hinder people from being able to come. And we know some, Lord, that already the devil has stood in their way in, in a, such a way, Lord, as they just don't know how to get around it. And I pray, dear God, that uh, you would just bless them. And, Father, they, I know they wanted to be here. So, Father, would you give them a double blessing, each and every one of them. And I pray, dear God, that you would just uh, lead, uh, lead me, Father, this weekend. Uh, Lord, help me to get it settled, what, what you want me to say, what you want me to talk about, what you want me to preach, what you want me to teach. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that I would follow you in all things and that your people would be edified, that your name would be glorified, your word would be magnified even above your name. We just pray, dear God, that you would bless our study tonight of your word. Be with those, Lord, who need uh, a touch from the master tonight. Be with Sister Linda. And be with all of our widows. I pray, God, that you'd just bless them and visit with them tonight. Give them comfort and grace. And, Father, we just thank you for saving us. And for calling us out to be your people and letting us be your children. And for you being our God. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would direct and guide my thoughts tonight. It seems like my brain's a little scrambled today. I pray, God, that you would... Get me focused now, and Lord, that you would have me say what honors and pleases you. And Father, Lord, if I don't end up doing the very best that I can tonight, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless it anyway. And Father, the power is not in me to begin with. The power is in your word, and our knowledge, and our understanding, and our wisdom. It's not going to come from me. It's going to come from your word anyway. So, Father, we ask you to bless it, magnify it tonight. And thank you, God, for making us your free people. And, Father, we look for others that we can share the truth with them because we know the truth would make them free as well. Father, help us, dear God, to be ever aware of the evil that is around us every day. The attacks of our enemy, Lord, upon us every day. And so, Lord, help us not be ignorant of Satan's devices, but, Lord, to be sober, to be watchful, Lord, to be circumspect in everything that we do, Lord. Grant us your eternal kingdom. Let us be a blessing to your kingdom tonight. Let us be a blessing to one another in fellowship tonight. Here is when we pray tonight. And, Lord, as we leave this place, then let us go out with songs of deliverance and father with the word of the gospel in our tongue to be looking for somebody to share that with this week so bless your mighty word we pray in jesus name and all of god's people said amen I, i've mentioned this before many times romans 6 not only gives us the doctrine of baptism it gives us the formula for baptism because we know that uh there are other churches who do not baptize the way that we Baptist. John was looking me in the eye going. And I'm going, what is wrong? Did I? Yeah. I was thinking I still had Butterfinger and I'm going, I'd eat it. <clears throat> but anyway, that there's, there's, there's people that teach it wrong. They teach a wrong idea and a wrong, and it's based upon a wrong understanding of what baptism represents. Paul says it. No uncertain terms here. What I mean by that, there's two ways of baptizing. There's the, what we call immersion by completely submersing somebody under the water, bringing them back up, obviously still alive, uh, or just sprinkling them the way some Protestant denominations do. We know the Catholic Church does that. I was told by a Catholic priest years ago that some Catholics... Uh, they have the right to baptize by immersion if they want to. I've never seen that. I don't know if he was pulling my leg or not. I've never seen one. Never seen one as far as I know. But he said that the, some of them are allowed to do it. Uh, but anyway, which, is the, which, which one 
If you run through these verses real quick, which one properly expresses what the, what the doctrine's telling you here? That so many of us says we're baptized into Jesus, we're baptized into his death, that we are buried with him by baptism. Into the, which, so does sprinkling portray burying or does immersion portray burying? Immersion does. And then like as Christ was raised up from the dead, which one? Sprinkling, does that show being raised up or physically raising somebody up? Does that show someone being raised up from the dead to walk in newness of life? And, and I've, I've always liked to tell people when you baptize, you're, you're showing three things. Something that has happened, something that is happening, and something that will happen. You're showing, number one, that you believe in the death the burial and the rising again of Jesus Christ. You believe it. You know it as if you were there to see it yourself, even though you weren't. So you just believe then what the Bible tells you about that. And that's to you is evidence enough. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So even though I wasn't there, I've read about it. I trust God's word. So I believe Jesus died, laid in the tomb for three days, rose again. That's, so that's showing what has been. It shows what is happening. When a person is baptized, what's happened to them in that situation in life right now is that they have died. The old man's dead. The old man's gone. Amen. The, the old life, the old ways of living, the old ways of thinking, the old ways of doing, those have died out. And the sins, they're buried, they're covered. We're going to leave them there. And we're going to walk again in a brand new life. If you've ever wanted the opportunity to have a second chance at life, Christianity is the one religion that can actually fulfill that promise. Others make promises of it, don't fulfill it. Christianity fulfills it. Amen. So it shows what has, has happened, what is happening now, but it shows what's going to happen in the future. What's going to happen in the future is you yourself, you're going to die physically. That old man is going to lay down in a grave. He's not going to get back up again. And you believe that at the last trump, the trump's going to sound. The dead are going to be raised incorruptible and the rest of us will be changed. And you're going to walk in heaven with Jesus for all of eternity. Somebody say amen. So that's, that's what Romans 6 tells us about it. Which is why, number one, sprinkling does not portray that. And it cannot portray that. Okay? I don't know what... I don't know if that comes from some earlier pagan practice. That I, My suspicion is that it probably does. But it's definitely not something that's, number one, directly taught in the scriptures. Number two, even alluded to in the scriptures. Not, not even suggested in that. All right? So now, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3, which is what I have on the screen. And so the, the, the question is, so does water baptism, the way, let's say, the Church of Christ, and there may be some other groups, well, we know that, um, let's say, the, the Lutheran denomination, they require... For you to become a member of the church, they require a baptism. They require your ability to recite a catechism. I uh, went to high school here in Festus with a young lady that, um, sweet young lady. We was in drama class together, choir and band together. And a real nice young lady, but she was taking her catechism classes at the Lutheran church. And I had a chance. I asked her about that. I said, what is that? Tell me what that is. And, oh, you answer these questions. They show you all these things. They read these things to you, teach them to you. And then you've got to recite this catechism. And if you, I guess, say, if you say everything correctly, then they go, okay, you're a Christian. It's pretty much that. And I went, hmm. But anyway, that was their thing. If you were baptized and you, you could say the catechism correctly, you made the, what they call a profession of faith through uttering the catechism, then you were then approved by that church for membership 
And according to them, membership in that local body was also membership in the body of Christ. And that's not true. You can be a member of every church in this town and die and go to hell. Okay? They can have you on the roll books of churches anywhere and you'll still die and go to hell. So it, that baptism in that church doesn't guarantee you salvation either. So here's what, here's what Peter was saying. If you look at very carefully what he said. Peter said, and he's talking about the angels that sinned, by which also he went and preached unto spirits in prison. The prison is the pit, lower parts of the earth, what Jesus said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. So Jesus went down there to preach in, to spirits in prison. Who's he preaching to? He's preaching to all those that died before he died. And that we know then, by way of the, the story of, of Lazarus and the rich man, that they are, in fact, divided into two groups. And this is, I think this is important to... To, to ponder this because then you have the Catholic doctrine that says well there's purgatory purgatory even though you're a good Catholic or you're a good Christian you still have to pay for part of your sins those have to be purged off you in purgatory so I guess God knew that those people would come up with some crazy thing like that so he made it sure that we know that men like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Lazarus, when they died, they went also to the lower parts of the earth. But they were in a place of comfort called Abraham's bosom. I want you to think about that. When you pick up uh, a child and you pull them to your bosom, doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, that is a, that is a token of comfort to that child and to a parent, I guess, or a grandma or grandpa. Nothing better than that, amen? I will take my wife and I will draw her to my, to my bosom every night. That's, that's how we end our day right there. So it's a place of comfort. Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. Jesus said he came from the bosom of the father. So he's in a place of comfort. Lazarus, neither Lazarus, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, it, Moses, any of the saints of the Old Testament, none of them were in any kind of torment prior to Christ setting them free. And, and why? They didn't have any sins to pay for either. Those also had been atoned for on the cross. So... But then you have another group where the rich man is. The rich man died. Lazarus died also. The rich man died. He lifted up his eyes being in torment. He's tormented. And he says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus and he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in torment in these flames. Of course, Abraham says, I cannot. There's a great gulf fixed between me and thee so that Anybody from here cannot go over there. Anybody from over there cannot come over here. It's not possible. And we know the rest of the story. So we know that all of those who died without faith were being in torments in hell. Everybody that's died since Christ, not knowing Christ, is in torment, the same place. And they're going to stay that way till the last judgment, okay? So that's what he's talking about here when he said he went to preach the spirits in prison. Christ went down and he's preaching to both groups. He said to those in Abraham's bosom, I got some good news. I'm going to set you free today. In fact, I brought somebody with me. This is a man, what was your name again? He was the thief on the cross next to me. And I promised him that today he would be with me in paradise. Let's give him a great round of applause. And by the way, you're all going with me. Woo! You can hear the roars. But then Jesus turns and looks and there he sees 
Jezebel, Ahab, all of the wicked kings, Saul of, uh, of the, the first king of Israel, Saul. And he sees all of those wicked people, Cain and all of his family, sees them all there and he says, I'm going to let you out for a day of judgment. But on that day of judgment, you're going to be judged for all your sins that you committed. And the, if you're found guilty, then the punishment for that is you're going to be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone for all of eternity. And if you think there's weeping and gnashing of teeth now, you just wait. It's going to be worse. Much worse. So that's what he's doing. So then it says... Verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long surfing of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. And he means that. Noah and his family, there was eight, they were saved by the water. The water was condemning the rest of everybody else, condemning the rest of the world, but it was saving Noah. And then he says, verse 21, the like figure... So he's teaching a typology story. He's teaching a, a foreshadowing. Noah and that story is a foreshadowing of what is going to happen. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. But if, and again, if we were to just take that part, put it up on a billboard everywhere, we would be deceiving millions of people who saw that billboard into thinking that water baptism will save you. Because if you keep reading, he specifically starts out by saying, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Water baptism, it's a, yes, it's a, it's a washing of the outside. But it can't clean the soul. And the soul is what's been defiled. Water on the outside cannot clean that. In fact, how could you clean your soul? Okay? So, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. What, what can wash your conscience clean? The Word of God. Whereas, yeah, I have knowledge of every wrong thing I've ever done. But I also have a knowledge that tops that knowledge. And that knowledge is I've been forgiven of every wrong thing I've ever done. And I like it that way. The answer of getting what and just going in a baptistry doesn't do that. Because my conscience never got wet. I take a shower every day, believe it or not. And it's never cleaned my conscience one time. He's, and he said, this is all done by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. If you turn over 1 Corinthians chapter 10 very quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we have another picture of this. In the, when Moses was leading the Israelites across the Red Sea, uh, that's still... As far as I'm concerned, uh, I think it was Cecil B. DeMille that made the Ten Commandments movie with Charlton Heston. And the special effects of the Red Sea opening in that movie, to me, that still blows me away as far as even the special effects they can do now with computers and all that. Special effects... That was amazing how they did that. And to me, it looks, I mean, it looks pretty real, too. Not bad for the 60s, right? Or maybe it's the 50s, I don't know. But anyway, not bad for that. But that was a baptism they went through. The Israelites going through the water, not over the water. It wasn't a bridge that God built. It was going through it. Paul says, moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat 
And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Now, here's a perfect example. If you just want an example of whether baptism can really save you or not, here's an example of people who actually went through the Red Sea in what Paul called baptism. But out of all of those people, we know it was over 600,000 people. We know for a fact it was more than that, that. That crossed through the Red Sea. How many of those people actually went into Canaan land? Two. Two and then the generation that was born in the 40 years in the wilderness. Those are the only ones that went in. So if water baptism was going to save anybody, surely it would have saved the Jews as they passed through the Red Sea. That's what he said. We're all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. But water baptism cannot save you, and it did not save any of them. It did, however, save Joshua and Caleb because the Bible says that they had a different spirit in them than the rest of the Israelites. That tells you that they were spirit baptized, not just water baptized did anybody ever play baptism when you was kids out at the swimming hole except me anybody did did y'all not do that that was the funnest thing in the world to do we used to, me and my sister and whoever we swimming with let's play baptism <laughs> We just had a ball doing it. But that didn't save any of them. They did all eat the same spiritual meat and they did all drink the same spiritual drink for that drink. They, they drank that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. Here again with the example thing, the, the foreshadowing word, typology word. To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And buddy, they lusted. Here is Moses up on Mount Sinai getting the very word of God written with the finger of God to bring it down for mankind. And those people are down there lusting over everything down there. So did that water baptism going through the Red Sea, did that save them? No. Didn't save any of them. Matthew chapter 3. Here's Christ's example. Now Christ, he was water baptized, was he not? Did it save him? He's, he, is a, he is an example of a person who got baptized that just didn't need to be. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And though a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now Jesus goes up before us to show us by his example what to do. But certainly he wasn't saved by water baptism because he didn't have a need to be saved by anybody or any, anything. He's God. He's the sinless one. Matthew 28, we are told to do this. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. So when you hear me, this is what I say. I baptize you, my brother. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And... That we do that because that's what Jesus told us to do. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So it's, it's, a, it's a practice to be done upon all of those 
who we convert to the faith of Jesus Christ. We are to baptize them by immersion, showing the death, the burial, the resurrection, the washing away of sins, as it were, and it's to be done with God's sanctioning. Anything done, uh, who in here has the power of attorney over somebody? Okay? And what that means is you can do things in their name without them being present. You can sign a document with your name and you've been given legal authority to act in their presence. And that's what he says here. Doing, doing it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I've been given authority by God to act in His presence, in His place, this function, this thing that we're doing. We're doing it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I am acting on their behalf to do this thing. And what I do, what you see me do on the outside... Well, they've already done it on the inside. Amen? 1 John 5, some of this stuff, we, I, we went through it actually a couple years ago. I looked my dates. But just very quickly, because uh, you'll see, like in the book of Acts, where there was people baptized. Uh, what must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Well... So again, the Church of Christ would say, well, that means you must, that you must be water baptized. But no, there's a difference. 1 John 5, 6, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bear witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record, record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So those are the three. When I baptize somebody in this baptistry, those are the three that I am acting in their place. Since those three are not physically here with us in this room, then I am acting, have been authorized to act in their place. And, and to me, now that's a big responsibility. If somebody says, Brother Mike, I won't be baptized by you. Well, okay, but before I baptize you now, I got to know some things. Because I'm acting as a representative agent of God in this, in this situation. And if God wouldn't baptize you, I won't either. John the Baptist wouldn't. When the Pharisees came to him, John, we want to be baptized. John the Baptist, I'm not baptizing any one of you. Show me the fruit of repentance. Show me the evidence that you're actually born again, that you've... Want God to forgive you of your sins and you're not out here playing games with me. So that's, that's the issue. That, so the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. There are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. The Spirit is down here. The water is down here. The blood of Christ covering our sins. They are all in agreement. Now, and there's six of them all together. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, the water, the blood. They're all agreeing that this person now is born again. They're saved. Their, their qualifications have been met for them to have a new eternal life. Um, we read Romans 6. Let's get to, because we're kind of out of... Turn, let me run through these verses and acts very quickly and just kind of hang with me as we go through this because I'll show you. You got you to know the doctrine first. Rule number one, we're not saved by water baptism. Rule number two, if somebody is a candidate for water baptism, should we deny them? No, not if they have truly been born again. Uh, so what if somebody wants to be baptized? So okay, next Sunday we'll baptize you. Something happens, God forbid, and they die. Are they still going to heaven? Yeah, still going to heaven. So when you're reading through the book of Acts, and you see all these verses where it talks about them baptizing people. 
make sure you understand the difference. Acts 1 5, for John truly baptized with what? Water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So is there a baptism that is superior to water baptism? Yes, Holy Ghost baptism. It actually outmaneuvers, it overrides, it, it, it has more authority over water baptism, and that is Holy Ghost baptism. Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, in this verse, was he talking about water baptism or spirit baptism? Spirit baptism. Why? Because if you, yeah, it's to, to get the Holy Ghost does not require water baptism. Now, I, uh, Google, rec or YouTube recommended me a video to watch last night, so I watched it. And buddy, I'm telling you, this guy... He was a Southern Baptist preacher in northern Georgia. And you've heard, have you ever heard of the Pentecost, the, um, what is it? The Pensacola Outpouring Revival? Well, he's leading the North Georgia Revival. He was, his church was a Southern Baptist church, him being a Southern Baptist preacher. But one night God showed him a vision. Now, he didn't read this in the Bible nowhere, but he said he was looking at his church's baptistry and he said, I saw, even though there was no water in it, the Holy Ghost had filled it with spirit water. And he said about, oh, I don't know, about four or five feet wide. And as long as that baptism was wide, he said, I saw that it was just a strip of fire down the middle. And he said, God was telling me right then that anybody who would be baptized in that water was going to be immediately baptized in the Holy Ghost and baptized with fire and their life was going to be changed. So now that he's made a big deal about of this, his whole church now is converted over to charismatic and he said, he's got people showing up, and they're bragging about this. He was on It's Supernatural with Sid Ross. That'll tell you something right there. The guy's messed up. But he's making this big deal now about all these people coming from all over the world who are getting baptized in his water, who all of a sudden they jump up, and all of a sudden they got the, they got the gift of tongues, and they're all speaking in tongues. And he said, you got people being healed everywhere. And he said, you had a, we had a guy, he was three weeks away from being dead. And he said, so he took a towel, they anointed the towel with oil, and they dipped the towel in the baptistry water, and then they sent it home, and his wife laid it on that guy, and all of a sudden he got healed from his cancer, and his cancer's no more, and he's alive, and, and he, he's making all these big claims about this thing. Lying through his teeth. God said it would be lying signs and wonders they would be using. Because they're telling you that if you perform this work, then God will give you something. Excuse me. If I've earned it, it's not a gift. And if it's a gift, I can't earn it. Okay? And that's, that's what he's done now. Big noise. People coming everywhere to get baptized... And what they're doing is they're making way more emphasis on being baptized in their baptistry than they ever were about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about what you do here in this baptistry. What a shame. Acts 2.41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What did they do to be saved? They received his word. Yes, they may have water baptized them, but it wasn't, salvation wasn't given on the water baptism. They received his word. Ephesians 5.25 explains this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ lo also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the baptistry. Isn't that what it says? No, it says 
by the word, not the baptistry. What has, it, what has the ability to cleanse your soul? The word of God, not the water baptistry. And you can leave your mouth open while I do it, which I don't recommend. Tammy, you know what they made me do? I was baptized in that baptistry, 1975. And there was a string of kids that was getting baptized all the same night. We all come back from Bible camp. And um, I used to love to play out in the woods. But my problem was I'm deathly allergic to poison ivy. So I was eat up with poison ivy. You know what they made me do? Be last. They didn't want to infect the water with my poison ivy scabs. That made me feel bad. So, I get washed after nine other dirty, smelly kids get washed. See what I'm getting at? Yeah. Psalm 19, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. That's the word that does that. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Psalm 119, 9. Wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. It's the word who washes us clean. Not the water of baptistry. Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Turn there very quickly. This is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And this is why all the verses in your Bible matter. Then Philip opened his mouth and he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. The eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And the Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is he saved? Right now he is. He's saved. But he was water baptized. And by the way, they went down into the water. And he wasn't sprinkled. Both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Philip was found at Azotus, passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So that eunuch was saved before he ever stepped foot into that water. Okay? Uh, by the way, a Acts 8.37 is missing out of the New International Version, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard, the Holman Standard Version, the New Living Testament, and on and on and on and on and on. That verse is missing out of all the modern translations. So Mark 16.15, go, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So what is this telling you? Those who... Those who already don't believe they're already damned you don't have to hear the preaching first and then decide i want to be damned you know that hasn't how it happened likewise he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved if you believe who then baptizes you the holy ghost baptizes you right then washes you clean and makes you whole water baptism again just shows on the outside what god has done on the inside first corinthians 12 13 for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether it be bond or free we've been all made to drink into one spirit Galatians 3.27, For as many as you have as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptized into Christ, not into the water baptistry. Ephesians 4.4, 4, There is one body and one spirit, even as uh, ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. My old, one of my old preacher mentors, uh, Brother Stanley Jones, uh, he told me he grew up in the country. And he said different preachers had different ways of baptizing people. And they all thought it was more spiritual than, than the other. And he said one would take them to, and go, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then bring them up. 
Another one would go, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then bring you up. So I thank God you have the preacher you have. Amen. Now, are those guys wrong? I wouldn't necessarily say so. A little bit different methodology. Some churches, they don't even have a baptistry. The church I pastored out of Richwoods, Missouri, down there on, it's not 47, it's Highway H, I guess. For years, they didn't have a baptistry, and they didn't want one. So we went to the big river. And the latest I ever baptized anybody was in late October. That was a little chilly. And they said, Pastor, quit being a wimp. There's several guys in that church got saved in January. On a Sunday morning and on a Sunday night, they went down to the big river, broke up all the ice, baptized them fellas. Yeah, that's Minnesota baptism, amen. So you understand now, water baptism, it's, it's understand, have the doctrine right. When you have the doctrine right, when you're reading the verse, then you can discern, is this water baptism or is this Holy Ghost baptism? Okay? Jesus, or Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. God had called him. God had saved him right then and there. Okay? But then he had to go finish his trip when he gets to Damascus. He's water baptized. Okay? And then the scales fall off of his eyes. But he was already saved as of that point. And I guess if you want to look at it technically, God had already saved him from the foundation of the world. Okay? So know your doctrine on baptism. That way when you're reading the scriptures and you look at a story like in Acts, you can see clearly. Uh, Paul starts out, I think 1 Corinthians talking about Baptism And Paul said, God didn't send me to baptize. And he said, I didn't baptize any of you except for a couple guys here at this church. But he said, Apollos has baptized many of you. And he said, so I planted the seed, Apollos watereth, but God bringeth the increase. So Paul did consider it as anything that if you'd not water baptize, you're not saved. He didn't consider it that way. He knew when you're saved, the Holy Ghost has already washed you out. Amen.